Q&A box. Um, and I will read out any questions uh, in the Q&A box. Okay, so Matt, can I just get you to introduce yourself a bit more, um, the work that you've been doing, um, and then I'd like you to give your, uh, some of your reflections on the video. Sure, yeah, good evening. Um, so my name is Matt Broomfield. I'm a freelance journalist from England. Um, and where, why I'm speaking here today is I spent three years living and working in this region, which a lot of you may know as Rojava, um, formerly the North and East Syria, so this Kurdish-led polity, which is so famous for leading the fight against ISIS and trying to implement these democratic, woman-led ideals in the face of all, uh, all of the violence um, that we've just seen pass before our eyes um, in this video. I spent uh, several years working there and, yeah, saw firsthand um, how some of these policies that you've mentioned today affect local people. Thanks, Matt. And Matt, I've just got one question now for you, which is um, in our previous email correspondence, you've described the Turkish-Syrian border as one of the as one of the most violently policed borders in the world. Um, I think the film looked at that in some detail, but I was wondering if you could just give us a bit more context and details of the tactics that Turkey uses um, to police this border. Mm. Absolutely. Well, I mean, I think for me, the really kind of interesting thing here on top of what's shown in the video is the extent to which this, this border is not just a passive thing. It's not just a wall. This border is responsible for producing this conflict, for producing this ethnic cleansing. Um, so, yeah, just to kind of go back a bit, you know, the, another funny thing about this border is even more so than many other national borders. It really is not a border between anything, you know, it's between Syrian Kurdistan and Turkish Kurdistan. But it's, you know, if that border wasn't there, but, you know, it just goes right through the middle of these towns, actually, where people speak exactly the same language, where, you know, for most, pretty much all of the 20th century, people came and went, popped across the border to get a packet of cigarettes, came back, and that's all changed with the increasing militarization of this border in recent years. So, I mean, interestingly, actually, um, the, the, why is that border there? It's because this was where the Baghdad barn train um, was laid by the Germans during the sort of scramble for the Middle East um, about 100 years ago, which kind of shows, you know, how arbitrary this border is. It just follows this train track and also, you know, how long an involvement the colonial powers, UK included, have in dividing up this region and contributing to the present day situation. Because, yeah, particularly since the start of the Syrian civil war and with um, increasing um, militarization or author authoritarianism in Erdogan's Turkey, this border has become, you know, yet, yeah, it's very militarized as, as you saw there. It's, I think, the certainly the third longest, possibly the second longest and the second deadliest land border um, with a wall in the world um, after the US-Mexican border um, and the border between Israel and Palestine, but it's spoken about still a lot less and understood a lot less than, than both of those cases. I mean, you know, when you drive along this border, it, it's complete. It's completely clear. You can see, as you can see from satellite imagery, on the Turkish side, it um, appears kind of you know green, um, modern, almost Western, and the Syrian side, um, unfortunately, is dry, dusty. The buildings are pitted with bullet holes. Turkey siphons the water um, from arriving into the side, so you know it's a very stark the difference. But at the same time. Um, yeah, you can see that uh, these are just uh, single towns that have been divided. And so, yeah, the point I want to make is, yeah, given this arbitrary nature, Turkey is then able to use this border as to further this conflict and to further its own intervention into Syria. Um, so, you know, by provoking clashes on the border, by firing, you know, not only at refugees trying to cross, but also many, you know, I've visited farmers who have just been out in their fields on the border, or what remains of their fields that haven't got you know this wall running through it and they're shot at while they're collecting wheat um just today turkish shelling killed two children actually um and turkey's then able to use this it's able to weaponize this against people so there's a, a very useful bbc study which shows that turkey claimed um there have been about 700 attacks against turkey along this border in the run-up to its recent invasion of northern syria bbc found that that was absolute hogwash and that actually there'd been no more than about 11 and several of them were actually Turkey firing into Syria. So, you know, there is no problem at this border. The people on the other side of the border, the Kurdish-led administration 
have no interest in attacking Turkey. They're only trying to build this um, project. You know, they're very, very careful not to, you know, even, it's not even at the Israeli-Palestinian level of throwing stones. They have got more than enough problems without picking a fight with Turkey, as people are probably aware. But as far as Turkey's concerned, if it comes to the regions where there's um, Islamist militias, Turkey's happy to let them come and go. As we know, 50,000 foreign ISIS fighters were able to freely transit this border and then to Syria through Turkey. Um, which is something, you know, the Western powers are very aware of. On the other hand, for the Kurdish regions, you know, one shepherd boy walking near is, is enough to provoke, you know, at least a bullet to the back of the head. Um, and twice in recent years, these devastating um, cross-border operations that we've seen, um, you know, on the basis of defending this border, which shouldn't be there in the first place, using British technology, um, for example, using uh, bomb racks made in Bristol, um, to yeah, kill hundreds, displace hundreds of thousands of Kurds, ethnic cleansing, particularly of Kurds, also of the Yazidi minority or Christian minority, and installing there this kind of network of Turkish backed Chinese militias. So I think, you know, yeah, the last thing I would say is this border has been put there to provoke conflict and to prevent the Kurdish people from achieving unity and achieving this vision of democracy. And while they have no interest in any kind of armed attack on this border, the aim is for the political project which is being put forward in northern Syria to be replicated on the Turkish side of the border as well and to spread and to grow through peaceful means and through sharing of ideas and through political dialogue. But you know, as you've seen from the video, we're a long way from that today. Thanks so much, Matthew. I just have one um, quick follow-up question from that as well. Just like, yeah, I guess, what's it like being a journalist, report, a freelance journalist, like reporting in and around or on and around um, that border. And are, are you allowed into Turkey or like, do you feel you're comfortable going into Turkey? No, I mean, no, certainly not. Um, you know, a, a, anyone with any association with the Kurdish movement, even in the capacity of a journalist, um, you know, faces at the very least a very long spell in a not very nice jail, um, if not something worse. Um, I mean, you, to be around this border, as I say, it's um, it's very striking because of, you know, kind of how it's very flat. So Rajab is very flat. It's a very exposed place. And you can really see, you know, it's very stark. It's, you know, the one thing that stands up in the, in the landscape for miles around is actually, you know, I think, although I was saying, you know, it's, it's dusty and so on. And uh, there is a big difference between the two sides of the border, but um, actually, you know, in the spring, particularly, these fields look kind of very green, very fresh, very nice. And there's something very surreal about it and surreal for local people, too. You know, it, it wasn't always this way and they were able to and they remember coming and going. And, you know, it, they, they, you can stand on the roof of your house and you can wave at your uncle who happens to live um, on the, you know, on the other side of the border. And, you know, so I think that kind of really brings home the, you know, the, the artificiality of all of this. Um, yeah, and then I think, you know, what you also see is the border becomes a, becomes also a kind of a fulcrum for p political action. You know, I remember during the during these, these successive Turkish invasions, which, you know, were so hard for the local people, and which, you know, resulted in these border towns being wiped out. You know, on the one hand, uh, the Kurds are in a very weak position. You know, these towns are small. They haven't got any weapons. They haven't got any air defence systems. They've barely got modern rifles. And you can see, you know, if you're looking at this through the eyes of a Turkish drone operator, it's kind of a joke, you know, and there, this border is so modern, so securitized, so clean. And, you know, they have got like two tanks in the whole northern Syria that they built themselves out of scrap cars. And they've put like tarpaulins over the roofs, over the tops of the town. So the drones can't see them. It's this kind of jury rigged response down there. And it's, you know, it makes you feel very weak. I think it makes the, the region feel very weak. But then um, people are kind of very bravely you know during the during this invasion went to the border civilians and kind of protested there and you know sort of stood in between the turkish army and, and their towns and particularly um these rather indomitable old kurdish women um and you know kind of stand there dance there and make themselves visible make themselves seen um and it's almost a, i feel on the one level it's an appeal to the world uh, but it's also you know it's an appeal to turkey they're kind of shaming Turkey for what they're doing and appealing to um, Kurdish people who happen to live on the other side of the border, but who are, you know, no different from them otherwise. Um, so yeah, it makes one feel very weak, I think, to be in the shadow of this wall all the time, but you do see people's strength to live like that day after day. Thanks so much, Matthew. Really important. Um, 
but also really sad insight into the border between Syria and Turkey there. Um, Les, I'm going to move on to you now. Um, are you with us, Les? Okay. Yes. Hey, Les. Um, can I get you just to introduce yourself and the work that you've been uh, that you've been doing? Yes. Well, my entry point to this was partly the campaign against criminalizing communities, which formed in order to oppose the so-called Terrorism Act 2000. And that was set up partly by Kurdish activists. So that got me involved in the Kurdish issues as well and led me to meet them and work with many of them. And then can I just, um, can I just give you the chance to reflect uh, on the video and then just to answer the following question as well. So how are European countries, especially the UK, complicit in the oppressions and attacks which are depicted in the film that we just watched. Yes, well, European countries are complicit in several ways. First, let's look at the companies that were mentioned in the film. And it says they have a leading status in the EU's security business, which is a kind of euphemism that is used by the trade itself. And this security business you know, encompasses arms, electronic surveillance, counterinsurgency techniques, and so on. And such exports are sought especially by regimes terrorizing their own population or nearby populations. Western government statements have sanitized Turkey's terrorism while denouncing serious terrorism. But in practice, this distinction has been nearly irrelevant for UK arms exports to Syria, as well as Turkey, and as we saw in the film. And another aspect is what you might call migration policy or migration control. I mean, Turkey has become a focal point for conflicts over migration, and we should understand why. About a decade ago, migrants from all over the Middle East and some from North Africa trying to reach Europe were demonized by right-wing political parties in European countries. Then they were drawing away votes from the larger political parties. So the EU found a solution to that political problem. It made lucrative deals with Libya, Lebanon, and Turkey, all with UK support. And focusing on the Turkey deal in 2016, it would be given 6 billion euros for two tasks. One, to prevent so-called irregular migration to Greek islands you know, as the first step towards reaching various points in Europe, especially Germany. And secondly, to improve the humanitarian situation of refugees in the country. Well, we've, the film has shown us what that has meant in practice. And for anyone who knew about the brutalities of the Turkish regime, the results were predictable and predicted. So the horror reported in this film, along with great opportunities for arms exports to Turkey. So these results are apparently no problem from European governments, which achieve their political aims on both counts. Now, further to the, the oppression shown in the film, uh, in the, the border between Turkey and Syria, after the Syrian army withdrew from Northeast Syria due to the civil war, Kurdish freedom movement, fighters liberated the region. Turkey responded by supplying Islamist terrorists with arms as a proxy for its war against the Kurdish freedom movement. And some of those arms must have come from Western countries, including the UK. No problem so far because the Kurdish freedom movement you know, is an anti-imperialist force, which is seen as a threat by imperialist countries. But when the Islamists rapidly gained ground, and especially in Iraq, then the view changed. Uh, that change was led by the US government, which saw those forces now as the greatest threat to its interests in the region. So it provided arms to the Kurdish People's Protection Forces in Northeast Syria, and then to the newly formed Syrian Democratic Forces. In, in, um, wider areas and together they pushed back against 
unite the ISIS forces. But the conflict continues within Turkey itself, where the US government and the UK government still strongly support the Turkish government's terrorism against the Kurdish people, you know, in the name of supposedly fighting terrorism, namely the PKK, which represents the Kurdish freedom movement in Turkey. So this complicity between the European Union and now the UK, regardless of whether it's still a member, you know, continues on all those levels. Thank you, Les. Um, so so I, I wait for your next question. <laughs> so I have a question for both of you now. You can both answer separately. Maybe your um, answers will complement one another. Um, but it's just, yeah, like, I guess, what do you both what do you both see as effective strategies that UK activists can do um, to stop arms sales going into Kurdistan and Syria and to bring peace around in this area? Feels a bit like a, a very far off reality, but we have to we have to start somewhere. Les, I'll go to you first. Okay. Yes. Well, the effort to bring about peace has several levels beyond simply the arms sale. So I think I'll answer in three parts. First, political demands. The Kurdish freedom movement in Syria as well, namely proposals for democratic autonomy of regions which declare such autonomy and democratic confederalism among such regions, you know, as an alternative to the totalitarian nation state which dominates most of the world, including the Middle East, we should demand the release of their leader, Abdullah Ocalan, from the prison where he has been kept by Turkey since 1999. Britain's main trade unions have been making this demand on the Turkish government for several years, we should ask British politicians and political parties to do likewise. And of course, that would contradict their policies of demonizing the KK as a terrorist organization. And that leads to the second main point about the anti-terror powers, which go back to the Terrorism Act 2000. We should demand that the UK ends its ban on the PKK as a supposedly terrorist organization. Now this matters because bans on various so-called terrorist organizations were directed at migrant populations in this country, not at their existence in other countries. The UK government has used the so-called anti-terror powers for systematically persecuting Kurdish activists and their allies. It has used these powers to raid their homes, to, to sequester their phones, to harass them regularly at ports, and to prosecute people simply for displaying the Kurdish flag, such as in the current case against Mark Campbell. So we should oppose this persecution by supporting all the activists who are being targeted. And then the third part regarding the arms exports that you mentioned, in the past decade, the UK has approved something like 2 billion worth of arms exports to Turkey. Many of those arms have been used against the Kurds, as well as against uh, refugees in general. So we should oppose all arms sales to Turkey, but verbal opposition may be futile, as we've seen for decades. So let's look at an analogy, arms exports to Israel. Well, Palestine action, has been physically disrupting the arms plants of Velvet Systems, leading the company to shut down some of its plants, and or at least to suspend operations of some plants. So this shows a way forward, that is physical disruption may be the only effective way to stop arms exports to oppressive regimes. So I'm gonna conclude there. Thank you so much, um, Les, and yeah, good point there about um, physical disruption. I mean, I, I've definitely been looking at uh, my Twitter feed a lot of all the work that um, the Palestine movement in the UK have been doing. Um, is it Al I can't remember the name, Albion, 
well, uh, the construction, the military construction, so the weapons construction plant as well, and pouring lots of blood all over it, and, uh, like fake blood all over it and things like this. So, yeah, very interesting. Um, all the parts were interesting, but particularly interesting in that last part as well. Um, Matthew, I'm going to come over to you. Um, I'm just going to ask the same question. Um, yeah, what do you view as effective strategies that UK activists can do to bring peace um, to Kurdistan and Syria? Um, well, yeah, I mean, to sort of, I think, yeah, Les very well outlined um, some of the key issues as they pertain to Britain. Um, so, yeah, just kind of build on that and also a bit about, yeah, other, other methods besides direct action. And so, the, yeah, firstly, I think, obviously, yeah, the arms, UK complicit in the arms business is a part of the picture, but, it, you know, it's very much not all. And actually, Turkey in general is moving quite hard towards um see it's autonomous um, domestic production of, you know, famously it's producing these drones, which is trying to market to the world. They're trying to develop their own fighter jet we, with British involvement potentially on the engine. Um, but, you know, it's going to be even if we get to a position where we can shut down all these factories, which would be which would be important. You know, British contribution is actually quite limited to what Turkey is doing today. And, you know, probably also quite limited now in terms of um, the British companies and the Assad regime. Um, so, you know, we need to be looking at these broader political questions, um, which Les outlined. And what I would kind of say on top of that is um, there, you know, there are ways I think that these issues can be made kind of very tangible and practical and real. Um, and so, you, you know, firstly, I would say actually, you know, the, something the Kurdish movement in general is good at is having kind of, you know, multiple strategies, you know, working on the parliamentary front in Turkey, working diplomatically internationally also working in communities, working in the diaspora and working, you know, on the militant level as well with the armed fights. Um, so, you know, they're kind of open to all methods. I think in these kind of conversations and particularly about Turkey, there are questions where there is a role um, for like British um, diplomacy and British Parliament to play. And you know, it is useful and it is important for people to be a, to going to their MPs, um, writing to them, um, in, gen in general, in these conversations, whether it's with MPs or I don't know, with your neighbour or whomsoever, it's always useful, I think, to speak about, you know, okay, so we trusted the Kurds in the fight against ISIS, we trusted them militarily, why can't they also be trusted diplomatically, politically, um, regionally to work positively to solve some of these problems? And that, of course, means bringing an end to the Turkey's attacks. I think it's always also worth highlighting in these discussions that it, the idea that the, the PKK, the Kurdish guerrilla in Turkey, could come to peace is not some pie in the sky idea. They were negotiating with Erdogan for two years. There was a peace process from 2013 to 2015. Um, and that's linked to what Les was talking about in, you know, that we do need to rethink why the PKK is listed as a terror organization and how then Turkey can use that to say anyone who does anything about the Kurdish issue is just a terrorist. And so we have within our rights to do whatever. And the, you know, it, again, it's something that's possible in Belgium. Two years ago, the Supreme Court, um, the Court of Cassation, did find the PKK is not a terror organization. They are a legitimate member of a civil conflict, a low-level civil war in Turkey. And that means the PKK can be held to higher standards, actually, than if they were just some criminal group. Um, both sides can be treated you know, with respect. Turkey and the PKK are both signatories to the Geneva Convention, um, both signatories to protections for the rights of children in war and so on. So it then creates the space to you know, actually talk and actually work and actually seek a solution. So I think, yeah, institutionally, that's, you know, that's very important. And then just the other point I would say is what's kind of distinct about the Kurdish issue and, you know, probably why why am I so interested in it and why am I talking about this aspect of things more, more than the Assad regime um, is because the Kurdish movement actually has a positive solution. It has answers, it has ideas, it has suggestions, not only diplomatically, but in terms of how do we organise society. It has a vision that it's just published for the whole of Syria to follow its federal role as a vision um, for how we can get out of the authoritarian crisis that Turkey is in. It has something to say, something very positive, which is unusual. You know, we don't just have to speak about the despair and the destruction, but they're actually trying to do something different. And so on that level, the important thing is just, you know, get involved, find your local Kurdistan solidarity group, speak to, you know, visit the Kurdistan center if you're in London, read um, about what's happening in Rojava and the movement and you know, it's very worth um, positively engaging as well. It's not just about, oh, we need to help these poor kids. They're, you know, more so than anyone else, they're really doing something about it. So learning about that, uh, I think, is very important. Fab, thank you very much for that answer, Matthew. Um, and what better way to start conversations than perhaps sharing the, the video from 
this event. Sorry for that shameless uh, promotion just there. Um, so I'm going to hand over to our participants now. I don't currently see any questions in the Q&A. Um, but if you do have any questions, do write them in now. The Q&A button, just in case you're finding it hard to locate, is um, should be uh, just under at the, next to the share screen button on the right, it says Q&A. So if you just type any questions into that, I'll give you... I just want to, someone who I think is in the audience just sent me a a private message um, mentioning quite correctly that today is um, Armenian Genocide Day, um, which yeah, I'll just say a couple of words about the Turkish Republic. You know, it's not only founded on anti-Kurdish politics, but you know, one and a half million Armenians died um, in a very brutal genocide um, at the very inception, just prior to the inception of the Turkish Republic. Um, and de denial of that genocide, which was, you know, in many ways, the blueprint for aspects of the Holocaust remains extremely current, you know, is completely normalized in Turkey. And, you know, and this links in, um, again, as you know, Joe, who wrote to me, pointed out to the present day situation in Armenia. So we don't need to go into that in detail. But there again, the, Turkey works very closely with Azerbaijan, another brutal regime, um, to impose an embargo on and attack um, the people of Artsakh or Nagorno-Karabakh. And I think kind of, um, yeah, the point is, you know, Turkey Turkey's not just about the Kurdish question, no, and it's playing a destabilizing role also in Libya, also in the Eastern Mediterranean, um, is yeah, also looking at Yemen. Um, I'm right now, I'm here in the Balkans, um, I, I live in Serbia, and Turkish influence is all over, you know, all these countries that, you know, countries that hate each other, but uh, they're all happy to talk to Erdogan, which he's really made a specialty. Um, and you know, Tur Turkey is it's an extremely critical country. It stands you know, between Europe and Asia, between Russia and NATO, and they're very aware of that, and they're able to use that A, to sell weapons to pretty much everyone, um, and B, to um, yeah, actively seek to influence a lot of conflicts. So yeah, there's, you know, it, it's a big issue, and it's not just about the Kurdish question. Yeah, and I'd like to amplify that, especially if we don't yet have any questions in being put. I mean, the, the Turkish regime's conflict with the Kurds come from a fundamentally you know, aggressive chauvinist version of national identity, which goes back to the foundation of the Turkish Republic, led by Kemal Ataturk, which initially encompassed all the ethnic groups, the so-called Young Turks found that republic, but it quickly turned into a racist regime modeled after European fascist movements and regimes. And the key concept has been Turkishness, you know, which is defined by the regime to exclude any cultural differences. And it's embedded in the law so that to insult Turkishness, that's, that's a direct quote from fundamental laws, is a serious crime. It can be punished by years in prison. There could be thousands of people awaiting trial or prosecuted for insulting Turkishness. So it's a catch-all phrase. And the, the Kurds are seen as perhaps the greatest threat to that chauvinist ideology because they're the largest minority group in Turkey. And they've developed a democratic culture, which ex existed for a long time, and then was extended through its engagement with Marxism and other left-wing ideas, libertarian ideas, such as for Murray Bookchin, was extended into the concepts of democratic autonomy and democratic confederalism, the concepts which have been appealing to a broad range of people in Turkey, especially left green people. And in fact, that's that's the name for their latest political party to try to evade a ban on the HDP in the general election next month. So now it's the left green party rather than HDP. And also it has grained much appeal you know, throughout Syria, you know, through the, the Syrian Democratic Forces. 
and, and other groups there. So I think that helps to understand why the Turkish regime has seen the Kurds as such a threat, you know, because it is a threat to that chauvinist racist regime for all those reasons. You know, and that's why to support the Kurds that we have to oppose the UK's collusion with that regime in all the levels that I described. Thank you. Both. Yeah, maybe, maybe I would just then, um, yeah, off the back of what, um, yeah, Ellen was saying about the, the, the alternative solution that the Kurdish movement puts forward, I just wanted to come back then to speak a little bit about Syria, because this documentary wasn't just about Turkey, no, it was also about the Assad regime. And often you know, in these conversations, and particularly in the Kurdish state, it tends to be a bit like, you know, Turkey is the, the focus, um, quite understandably, because Turkey that is trying to ethnically cleanse, is ethnically cleansing the Kurds. But the person who's killed the most people, the person who's responsible um, immediately, at least, for, for the Syrian crisis is Assad. Um, and he's, he's the man who killed in the hundreds of thousands uh, of civilians, not just hundreds, um, in Syria. And then I, I think now, you know, it's been 10 years and there is this general sense, oh, you know, what a shame and yes, that is slowly being normalized. And, the, you know, the idea is, you know, there is no real opposition left, um, you know, and in a sense, it's true, there is a small vocal um, democratic opposition abroad on the ground, your options are <laughs> sort of start to start to um, slightly to the left of ISIS and move right quite hard. Um, apart from uh, the the Kurdish-led administration in the country's northeast, and you know, it's I think they, you know, it's often like, oh, you know, there's no alternative now. Assad's what I'm trying to put up with it, but there is an alternative. There are millions of people living outside his control and outside the control of what sadly become the largely Islamist um, uh, authoritarian opposition. And you know, this region that we're talking about, we are talking about the Kurds. Actually, Java North East Syria is majority Arab now, and the Syrian Democratic Forces that led the fight against. Um, uh, ISIS, their majority Arab as well. I mean, I think no one expected this actually 10 years ago. The Kurdish movement didn't expect to take control of these former ISIS heartlands like Raqqa, you know, was formerly the capital of the caliphate. It's now pretty much the, the safest city um, in Rojava. And that's actually where they moved the seat of governance um, because it's safer there than by this border, which we were talking about. So, you know, then they have, you know, they have ideas, they have proposals. It's difficult and the way ahead is long, um, but right now that we have this absurd situation where the Kurds are not even allowed to participate at all, not one representative in the official negotiations over the future of Syria. And, you know, there are scores of shady foreign characters with links to these Islamist militias who are allowed to turn up to Geneva and waffle on about nothing. But um, the, the, the only people who are putting forward a serious alternative are being denied place. So I think, again, that's something really positive and important to, to push for is, you know, the, this region needs recognition, needs diplomatic recognition, and we need to listen to what they're saying about a better future for all Syrians and not just those living in the Kurdish regions. Thank you both. Um, we've got a few questions now popping up in the Q&A, so I'm just going to read those out now. The first one's by Jerry. Um, so it's not so much of a question just as a statement, but I'll read it out nonetheless. So I'm encouraged by Palestine action, uh, Palestine Action's action against Albert. But living in Hampshire, we have BEA systems, Kinetic and Airbus. But many of the local populations are employed by military or these firms and any actions would be unpopular. And the MPs are highly supportive of armed firms. Um, not so much of a question, I guess what I might say is sometimes uh, the moral thing isn't necessarily always the popular thing. Um, but I don't know if Les or um, Matthew has any response to that. If not, I can move on. Yes, well, two kinds of responses. Well, of course, that would be true of any place that has arms factories. But there'll be many other people who feel outraged and ashamed, and even more such people if they knew about where the arms are going. Because if they don't know, then it might just seem abstract. You know, military arms don't make the world a better place, but they knew how the arms were being used, then, then it becomes more feasible to organize a significant opposition and the potentially to disrupt the plants, regardless of what the workers there feel. Now, and, and this relates also to the trade unions. As I mentioned earlier, that all the main trade unions in this country for a long time have demanded the release of Abdullah Opshanan and repeal of or at least the, the ban on PKK, 
But in, in one such webinar, I asked the trade union representatives, well, that's great, but your members probably <laughs> in, are helping to produce the arms that help Turkey to kill people. So what can be done about that? And he gave some vague answer. Oh, that's a difficult one. Now what it involves our livelihoods. Well, of course it's difficult, but it has to be confronted. And you know, for as long as the working class depends on, well, some of the middle class too, you know, depends on arms exports for their livelihoods, then that will have the effect of politically constraining what people can say, much less demand. So there needs to be a, a political movement that engages at least the dissident members of those trade unions. And when organizing an opposition, handing out leaflets to, to the workers there, as well as to people more generally, can be a way of identifying such people who want a different economy. Thanks, Les. That brought up memories of um, that film slash documentary called uh, No Pass Around in a Scottish accent. Where... Wow. Where the uh, Scottish yeah. workers refuse to sell, uh, sorry, where the Scottish workers ref go on strike and refuse to construct um, plane parts for I think it's Pinochet, Pinochet's regime. Yes, yeah, and the, the planes ended up sequestered in yeah. Britain until the the regime ended many years later. Um, moving on getting a bit conscious of the time now. Um, Aisha asks, um, how are the Kurdish communities? on the Turkish side of the border responding to the ideas of dem uh, democratic confederalism developed in Rojava? And how does the Turkish government respond to that? Um, maybe perhaps I can say something about that. So yeah, um, actually, these ideas were being trialed in Turkey before they ever were in Rojava. Um, so yeah, there's, you know, it's, it's a good question. There is, I think, a, a, sometimes a misconception a bit that what happened in Rojava sort of almost sprung out of nothing um, in 2011 um, with the outbreak of the Syrian civil war. But as Les mentioned, this movement has existed for decades. They were fighting for a long time, but also working very hard clandestinely in both Turkey and Syria to work in villages, work in local communities. You know, I remember meeting these, yeah, aforementioned formidable old Kurdish women who were telling me about having these secret meetings where they would... Um, you know, all leave their shoes outside different people's houses and then climb over the fences so that the Assad regime would have realized that they were having meetings, um, you know, leaving messages between the revolutionary comrades in the ch their children's clothes so the police would be less likely to find them and so on. So, it, you know, it took a long time to develop this, uh, these ideas and they have also been, um, in a slightly different way, attempted to be introduced in Turkey through a kind of dual power approach. Um, uh, so, you know, with uh, they, they have a legal political party there now on the brink of being banned um, and they have been tried to introduce through civil society organizations through community organizing some of these ideas you know the, the community justice the cooperative economy these ideas have been tried there um what set that back very badly was in 2015 there was like uprisings in in turkey around the time of the end of this peace process and the turkish government raised um several of its own kurdish cities pretty much to the ground so i mentioned earlier when you look across the border it looks very nice very green very fresh much more developed but a lot of that development is new because turkey shelled its own cities its own kurdish cities to smithereens and killed a lot of civilians um and ever since then has been pursuing an even more aggressive line against anyone involved in kurdish activism so you know there are now thousands um, of kurdish politicians kurdish activists lawyers journalists in prison uh, turkey among the world's top three jailers of journalists 60 out of 65 of the mayors who were elected for the kurdish political party have been summarily removed from their posts and jailed. About 40% of uh, all members of um, this uh, political party have faced some kind of criminal investigation, and they're now about to ban the whole party outright. So <laughs> to answer the second part of the question, Turkey is not very keen on these ideas. And you know, it's partly about this anti-Kurdish chauvinism, but it's also a fear of a political alternative and the idea that different communities can work together. It's very anathema to the patriarchal authoritarian Islamism, which has characterized the end of um, President Erdogan's regime. Um, and then, yeah, just to mention quickly, there are very important Turkish elections coming up in May. And again, this is somewhere where I think parliamentary pressure can be very helpful. The HDP, this party um, that we're talking about, is a sister party of Labour. It's the third largest party 
in Turkey, it's about to be banned outright, which will be, I think, the ninth time in a row that the Kurdish political party has been banned, and they're going to put a load of its leaders in jail again. Um, so make a mockery of the idea that this, you know, Turkey is nominally, you know, democracy, it's nominally part of the European community, blah, blah, blah. I mean, these are points where political pressure is very important. So, you know, if you believe in these values of parliamentary democracy, you have at least to defend them and at the same time to create space for these um, dual power um, building of systems to continue outside the state's authority. Thank you. Matthew. Yeah, Matthew, Matthew has described very well the physical destruction that was wreaked against the, the Kurdish people and especially against any locality that had res resisted the aggressive security forces. I just want to add something about again, the so-called anti-terror powers. If you were to add up all the people in the world detained under anti-terror powers, half of them are in Turkey. Right? So what does that mean? It just means the law is so broad and vague that it can be used to detain anyone who dissents from the government. And on the rare occasions when I think Turkish politicians have been questioned about this, um, well, they can point to Britain. Because those laws in Turkey have many similarities with the so-called anti-terror terrorists here. I mean, the main difference is the scale of their use. Well, here it's used as a kind of low-level harassment with just a few prosecutions. There it's used to detain like tens of thousands of people. The, the, the type of wording is, has many similarities. So again, if Britain is being used to legitimize that reign of terror in Turkey, then we should have a closer look at Britain right? and, and demand the end of both, the end of these so-called anti-terror powers and Britain's collusion with Turkey, which extends far beyond this resemblance in laws. It also extends to the security services, exchanging information on what, what activists are doing you know, here and there. Um, and just a quick question from me as well about the upcoming elections. Um, from my understanding, there's like essentially a coalition of parties running against Erdogan's party. Is there a sense that this party will be more willing to um, communicate and cooperate with the PKK or with, or with Rojava in general? Um, you mean the yeah, left green party? Sorry. Is that, you mean the left green party? Is it, or... uh, yeah. Uh, Abby, do, you, do you want to say something about that, Les? Or should no, I? No, you, you go ahead first. I just wanted to clarify which party he meant. <laughs> yeah, because yeah, so it's a little bit. So what's going? Okay, so there's there's two elections, right? There's the election for the president, and there's also the parliamentary elections for the MPs, um, which are sort of separate processes. So there's the two large blocks, the Erdogan block, and then the opposition, um, the JHP led by Kamal Kılıç Daroglu, and they're both kind of, so that's not the, the Kurdish-led party, those are the two largest blocs, and they're both different shades of nationalist. Um, they're actually, you know, both have like very right-wing parties in their bloc, they're both, you know, Kılıç Daroglu is kind of more, more of a liberal, perhaps more of a reformer, perhaps on some issues, um, but is also very willing to, you know, he's backed, um, the Erdogan in both of his invasions of northern Syria, he's backed Erdogan in attacking the Kurdish-led opposition. He's now, I think, he's trying to, you know, he's formed a sort of strategic um, relationship, tactical relationship with the Kurdish opposition party, the third largest party, um, with the aim of getting him into power and unseating Erdogan, and they've kind of agreed to do that. I was speaking um, uh, just yesterday, actually, to some MPs from the HTP who are campaigning on the ground, even though knowing they might be chucked in jail at any moment. And they were saying, you know, there is a real sense of, okay, now something's going to change. Erdogan is going to go and that is going to have positive benefits. Kilic Drogbu is going to want to mark a break with it, with the Enchon regime. He may be less willing to launch direct military attacks on Rojava. He may make some reforms to rule of law, um, release possibly some of the political prisoners. On the other hand, um, you know, he is, they would, maybe they would like to see him. They will hope that he would restart some of the peace talks with the PKK. It's possible. That would be very good. But he's, you know, he's no knight in shining armor, as you might expect. He's you know, taken when it suited him, uh, very not the anti-Kurdish line himself, despite being of partially Kurdish heritage, which we never mentioned before this week. 
Um, on Rajava, for example, although he's perhaps less lucky to assault, um, he is very focused on getting rid of these millions of refugees um, in Turkey, which Turkey claims to protect, but in fact exploits, and is willing to work with Assad to do that and to um, uh, forcibly transfer them back into these regions which have been cleansed of the um, local, primarily Kurdish population, and install them there with or without their with or without their will. Um, and also, you know, is yeah, perhaps willing to continue taking a harder line against the, the PKK um, and, you know, maybe aligning more with American interests. And so he's kind of generally seen as, OK, this is a better guy than Erdogan, he's easier to deal with. Perhaps there's truth there, but the HDP are very aware that the problems in Turkish society are running, brief, running very deep. And so, you know, what they were saying to me was, OK, maybe this election, if our party is not completely banned and eradicated, if Erdogan agrees to step down, there'll be a bit more room to start rebuilding some things in Turkish society. It's a very important turning point, but it, you know, it might not be the, the panacea, of course, for the Turkey's ills. Uh, thank you. Yes, I mean, in, in that next election, I, mean, I think it's the first time that the, the Kurdish party, whatever it was called, hasn't run presidential candidate for this time for many reasons. No, partly because the, the main opposition party has a prospect to win. And there is some hope that a large vote for the parliamentary candidates and the local candidates from the Kurdish party or you know, the left wing party would help to shift the CHP, you know, this opposition party, away from at least the worst practices of physical repression and mass detention, criminalization, and so on. That's putting it modestly, but e even that would be an enormous improvement over the current situation. That you know, as as regards the migrants' relationships with Syria and so on, it, it's uh, it's more difficult to see you know, prospect for improvement, and it might be worse, you know, as Matt described. Thanks, Les. I'm um, just going to move on to the next question, um, which is from Klaus. Uh, it may not be relevant for, day, for today, but do we know who supplied the chemical weapons that Sudan used against the Kurds in 1988? My sense is uh, not, but... Well, eventually there was documentation to show that it was exported by the US government. And in fact, there's a a film clip which has been shown many times where Donald Rumsfeld is meeting Saddam and it was they invite a journalist to film them. I, I don't think it was known at the time what was being discussed, but later it was deduced that the discussions included the agreement to supply the chemical weapons to Saddam. And then when Rumsfeld was interviewed late, much later and shown this film and asked about the chemical weapons, he replied sarcastically, oh, there I am. I mean, that shows his contempt for any questions about his sordid role you know, as the front man for the US weapons industry and US imperialism. Thanks, as I wasn't aware of that. I, I'll, I want to look up that um, clip now as well. Um, final question from Aisha is, um, does UK and US allow countries like Turkey to produce their own arms, or is there a sense that Western powers want to keep the technology to themselves? Um, I mean, yes, it's always used as a political tool, though. So yeah, as, as I mentioned, um, Turkey has had a big drive under Erdogan to produce more of its own weapons. And, you know, it, it's not like, you know, there's the just, just the Western East. Turkey is itself an imperial power. Turkey is an interventionist power. Turkey engages in proxy warfare. In turn, you know, um, it, it goes all the way down. And, you know, many of the things we're saying about, we might say about the British government also, you know, what one could say about um, the imperialism being practiced by the Turkish government. So, you know, they do have the, yeah, their own technologies. Um, and then what we also see is this kind of, it is this question currently i think is very much linked to the nato russia um question also and 
year, a big part of you know why is Turkey significant is also because Turkey is the second largest army in NATO, it's extremely strategically located. Um, and this is kind of why this is the justification, essentially, in large part for the, you know, the Western America in particular to allow Turkey to engage in these um, violent attacks against the Kurds domestically and abroad. As we saw, the people may remember last year, Sweden and Finland wanted to join NATO due to the Ukraine conflict. All the other countries said yes. Turkey said no, not unless you exercise the veto, not unless you agreed to this list of demands. One of them was uh, more access to Western military technology, um, also um, stopping support for Rojava, whatever limited support there is, stopping humanitarian aid to Rojava, exporting a whole list of people, journalists exporting a Swedish MP um, who's never set foot in Turkey. It's kind, of, it's kind of insane, you know, what Turkey is able to demand because it's seen as so strategic and so kind of important, so vital to NATO and so on and so on. And so now, Something else that might change for the negative when Kılıç Drogu gets in is currently Turkey is not being allowed the very latest Western jets. Why? Because it got a missile defense system called the S-400 from uh, Russia um, and the, the West was annoyed about that. And it kind of showed, you know, that Turkey is playing quite smartly, it plays Putin against Washington all the time, tries to get permission from one or the other of them to launch an attack in Syria, which it can't do without the Russian or the American green light, for example. And Erdogan has always been playing this in between the game. That might change a little bit. Kılıç Daroglu, this guy who's probably going to come in, will probably have a more unambiguously pro-Western line, more willing to work with America you know, directly and all the time, even more than Turkey already does. And that might then have a negative effect, you know, that America says, okay, fine, you can have this advanced weapons systems, and who's Turkey going to use them against against the Kurds, of course. So there was this kind of bizarre period, actually, um, over the last years, where America has been working with the Kurds, as we know, in Syria against ISIS, but at the same time, America was giving Turkey intel to allow them to strike members of the Kurdish movement in Iraq. So, you know, it's kind of completely farcical. But um, the, 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 uh, these questions are always politicised. Turkey is aware of the fact that, um, you know, a, it can try and extract concessions and access to Western military technology is just one, you know, one part of that picture. Yeah, I'd like to add, I mean, two aspects of Turkey's military and political role. And one is if we go back to the Cold War, well, the supposed threat from the Soviet Union was used to justify you know, alliances with regimes that were terrorizing their own people and other people, you know, including Turkey, especially given a strategic location. And that pretext you know, was very flexible for what was probably their main role, namely suppressing any threat to imperialist interests in the region, I mean, same rationale for the great support given to Israel. And that relationship will continue you know, for as long as the Western countries maintain their imperialist interest, then Turkey will be central to that. And if Turkey can produce its own weapons, then so much the better. Now, as regards the in, uh, NATO expansion to say you know, Sweden and Finland. I mean, Sweden has a, a long history of granting political asylum to people who have been persecuted. I remember when I was a young rebel against the Vietnam War, Sweden became famous for you know, easily granting asylum to draft resistors from the USA. And that has continued. You know, up until recently, with the Kurdish refugees from Turkey's state terrorism and the, the repressive laws that I was describing. But when Sweden asked to join NATO, then, of course, Turkey used the opportunity to say, you must give up your terrorists, meaning these, these Kurdish political refugees who have become fully integrated into Swedish society by now after many years. And so, I mean, that, that is, is yet another reason why NATO expansion should be opposed, in addition to the more obvious reasons. Okay, I think uh, we're going to wrap up there. I would just like to say, um, again, thanks so much to our two speakers. I felt like I learned so much um, about the Syrian-Turkish border and about the relationship.